Today's a, a, a new day. It's not like yesterday. It's not like tomorrow. Uh, for you that are watching, I'm not standing. I'm sitting, and the reason I'm sitting is I've had surgery uh, on my right foot. And uh, one of the dangers of being a diabetic, so please pray for me and pray for the healing of that foot. And the beautiful thing is I've got a great podiatrist, and she's very well and very attuned to what's going on. And I get it wrapped up regular by nurses so I'm so thankful so hopefully it's not inconvenient it's in you today but we're going to continue in the book of Psalms last week was Psalms 1 because we talked about how to be planted how the righteous are planted how the unrighteous are planted and today I want us to talk about contentment God's way contentment is one of the hardest things to have and keep everybody wants it everybody seeks it we try everything that a man and a woman can try to be content. But until we try God's way, and he gives us a simple formula right here on contentment. In Psalms 51, it's known as David's prayer. And David is praying for pardon. And the reason he's praying for pardon is because he became involved in a double sin. The first sin was adultery with Bathsheba. The second sin was murder. He's the one that sent her husband out to, the, to the, the busy line of the war, the front line, and there he was killed. So he was involved in it. So in Psalms 51, the first 17 verses, it says this, Have mercy on me, David says. He's pleading to God. He knows what it is to, to be forgiven, but this is something new he thought he would be able to handle. And may I tell you a secret, nobody can handle sin. Only God can help us. So he says, be mercy. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, which means never fails. His love never fails. Never fails. According to your great compassion. He says, blot out, take away my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Now the word transgressions means love and action. So remember that. He says, blot out my transgressions, which means I've got to change them. And I can't change them without compassion because the word compassion is the word that means love and action. So then he says, wash away all my sins. Just not one. All my sins. All my iniquities. And cleanse me from all my sin." He says, for I know my transgressions. In other words, I know what I've done, and you and I know what we do. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost parts. Cleanse me with your hyssop, and I will be cleansed. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. And then he says in verse 8, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Very descriptive of what David is talking to God about. And then he says in verse 10, which is a beautiful verse. To me, it's a key verse in verse 51. Create. Only God can create. Only God can recreate. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. So in sin, he's confessing that I don't have a pure heart. And you and I, when we sin and we know we've sinned and we've not asked for forgiveness, that heart that was pure is now not pure. And then he says, do not cast me from your presence. He's experienced it. He's been right there with God. He's a man after God's heart. And God has been there with him, but all of a sudden he realizes because of his lust, he said, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And here's the key, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. 
And verse 13 says, Then, so Lord, if you do all of these things, then I will teach transgressors your way. So as he gets his heart restored, as he comes to God, as he's recreated, he then says, I will be able to teach your transgressors your way. And sinners will turn back to you. <clears throat> he says, save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, he says, open my lips so I can do those things. And my mouth will declare your praise. I can't declare his praise until I learn how to praise and give him the glory. Then he says, you, don't, you do not delight in the sacrifice, or I would bring it. See, folks, anybody can bring an offering, but not everybody chooses to be recreated when they're sinning. And he says, you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a sp broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, and God you will be despised. There's four things I want us to look at very quickly in Psalms 51 as we talk about contentment God's way. Number one is to recreate a person. Listen to this. To recreate a person is a greater work than to create a person. To recreate after you've already come into, had Christ come into your life and you're living for Christ and then you sin and turn your back on him, it's harder, it's a greater work to be, to create, recreate. So how can this happen? How can I be recreated? How can I come back to God? Number one is, I've got to pray for forgiveness. It says in verses one and two. Now David's sin is found in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And there he talks about his sin of adultery and he talks about his sin of, of murder. And you and I need to pray for forgiveness. How do you do that? Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me of looking at pornography. Lord, forgive me for drinking. Lord, forgive me for uh, cursing. Lord, forgive me for taking your name in vain. Th forgive me for judging. You, you know what the sin is. And you and I, when we point at others, we always have three coming back at us. So remember, God knows you personally. Then the second thing in the way of having contentment found in verses 3 through 6 is confession. So first I pray. Second, I confess. Our sin is primarily against God. Primarily it is against God. It could be against a person that you're sinned with or you're sinning about or whatever. But the bottom line is you've sinned against God. Because he tells you do not do that and he tells you why do not do that. So our sin is primarily against God. Verse 4 says, he says, against you, you only have I sinned. And folks, there comes right down to the bare ground, realizing my sin sins against God. You know, I have sinned against God. People say, oh, no, you sinned against me. No, I sinned against God. I knew better. Knowing to do right and not doing it, it says in the book of James, it's a sin. And then number 3 the third way to be content, God's way from Psalms 51, is to pray for pardon. P-A-R-D-O-N, pardon and restoration. Verses 7 through 12. Pardon is basically asking that I could be forgiven of something I've done. The judge will might pardon you from some uh, crime that you've committed. And that means you no longer have to serve. So you and I need to understand. We need to pray that God would pardon us and that God would give us restoration. Now, purity involves two things. It says in verse 10, a pure heart. Create in me, O Lord, a pure heart. That means returning to my love, returning to the Lord, returning to the one who given me hope. And then the second way that purity involves is faithfulness and service. So I cannot have faithfulness and service without a pure heart. When my heart is pure, I can be faithful and I can serve. And you and I need to understand that. If I'm not serving, if I'm not faithful, I need to look at my heart. I need to look at my sin life. I need to look at my soul. I need to look at what's changed because you know who's changed? You. God hadn't changed. You've changed. Your church hasn't changed. You've changed. And then restoration comes as we are pardoned. As I am forgiven, I am being recreated or I am being restored. And 
Nobody can restore me like God. Nobody can give me hope like God. Nobody can give me newness like God. Nobody can bring into my life like God. Nobody can lift me up and forgive me and make me feel comfortable with who I am as a sinner forgiven. Then number four way to have con- contentment God's way is found in verses 13 through 17. He says, making a decision to praise God. So first, you've got to pray for forgiveness. Second, you've got to confess your sins, tell God what it is. Third, you've got to pray for pardon and restoration. Pardon and restoration. Lord, forgive me and restore me. Because restoration comes as we are pardoned. And then four is decision to praise God. You know, you do make a decision. In the Old Testament, the word worship means to bow a knee. That means to bow your knee. That shows humility. And as you bow your knee, you're staying focused on one thing, and that is God. So what pleases God more than sacrifice? is a humble heart that praises God. The one thing that pleases God more than sacrifice, more than bringing uh, money or bringing gifts is this. Ready? A humble heart that's willing to praise the Lord. You know, praise the Lord. Oh, my heart. Praise the Lord. Oh, my heart. And all that is in within me. That's something you can do. So many people do it privately, but you can do it when you worship also. Give God the praise and the glory on Sunday. Let God see how much you love him because he sees your heart. In closing, your attitude begins to falter when sin enters your life. When I welcome sin into my life, all of a sudden my humble heart begins to basically suffer. And then your attitude begins to falter when sin enters your life. A withdrawal, a harshness, and a fleshly nature begins to invade us, all caused by sin. Now when I start changing to where I begin to withdraw and my response is more harsh and I have a fleshly nature that begins to invade me, it all causes me to sin and it calls by sin. So sin is first appealing. Oh, you, your eyes, the lust of the eyes. It's appealing. So as I look at sin, as I taste it, whatever it is, it's very appealing. But then afterwards, when I realize what I've done, it's appalling. So first, it's appealing, and second, it's appalling. Well, why did I do that? Why do I feel so bad about it? David shows why. David's a good example for us. And then sin is first alluring. It's amazing. Sin seems to be something away from me. But then it's alienating. Once I've got a hold of sin, which was, al- which was alluring, it then makes me feel alienated from the body of Christ. It makes me feel alienated from other Christians. It makes me feel alienated from my Heavenly Father. And third, sin is first deceiving. Oh, it looks so good. It tastes so good. Oh, if only I had that. If only I could do that. It's so deceiving. But then after it's deceiving and it's got control of my life, it then becomes damning in my life. I don't feel the same. I feel judged. I feel ashamed. I feel dirty. I feel separated from God. Now, it promises life. Sin does. The old devil said to the Lord, come, follow me. I'll give you everything. And the Lord says, my heavenly father already has everything. And you and I need to understand no matter how good the world looks, it's all temporary. Because my home is built up with the Lord. That's where my hope is. And then also, it promises life, but it also produces death. With sin comes death, spiritual death. Death of our, our heart is not what it should be. Our mental being is not what it should be. Sin is an effective, is worse than any cancer you'll ever have. Cancer may kill you, but sin sends you to hell. And you and I need to understand that God promises life, not sin. Sin is the most disappointing thing in the world. Let me say it again. Sin is the most di- disappointing thing in this world. To, re- to recreate a person is a greater work than to create him. 
to recreate a person, you and I. It's a greater work than creating one. And so he's saying, yes, you were born, you were created in his eyes and his image. But to be recreated because of your sin and what the world has done to you and what the devil has done to you is harder because once you've tasted the other side of what sin is, it's hard. And it will constantly be on your mind because you're thinking about it. And maybe if you're thinking about it, you've not been recreated. So everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. And you and I need to understand, as I go back to God in Psalms 51, where David says, Create in me a new heart, O Lord. He will do it. But it starts with me. It starts with you. Create in me a new heart, O Lord. Now, why is that? It can only happen because Jesus is my shepherd. I shall not want. If you're listening today, and I encourage you to answer this one question. Where is my life with God? Where's my contentment with God? Where's my praising with God? Am I being, am I withdrawing? Do I have harshness in my life as I talk back to people? Do you have a fleshly nature that overrules everything and all you can do is think about it? Folks, the flesh will eat you up. It's worse than a cancer. And you and I need to understand Sin is the most disappointing thing in the world. First disappointing to God, our Creator, then to ourselves, and, and it affects our family. So stop it. Stop it. So why aren't you a Christian if you're not? Why haven't you said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, living God, and turn your life around, repent, turn it back, and start walking towards God? Let the devil see your back instead of your face. Let the devil try to get you to turn around, but you say, no, because of the blood of Christ. I have joy, 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 unspeakable, joy, 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 unspeakable. So there's no way I'm going to disappoint God when I turn to him. There's no way I'm going to disappoint God and the angels in heaven will rejoice when I follow the King of kings and lords of lords. Let's pray. Father, there's someone listening to us today. I pray you would speak to their heart. I pray you would speak to the sinful part of their life that uh, is not where it should be. And they'd realize this one simple thing, Father. When I sin, it caused me to be withdrawal. It caused me to be harsh. It causes me to have a fleshly nature. And that nature begins to invade me. If that's true, Lord, help us to stop today and repent, which means to turn around, turn away from that which has got a hold of me and to follow you. Lord, you're all things to me. You're my shepherd. I shall not want. And with messages like this, Father, I'm reminded of how much God loves me through Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.